Brilliant. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge. I'm the chair of the Social Capital Research Group. Uh, the Social Capital Research Group is a, an international collective of researchers. There's probably about a thousand or so members now. Uh, we have a Facebook group uh, and we hold regular webinars and there's uh, a lot of material on our website as well that's freely available for anyone who's interested in social capital. I'm delighted today to be able to introduce Associate Professor Paul Haynes, who's going to give us a, a presentation. I'm sure anyone who's doing research or is interested in the concept of social capital is, is familiar, particularly with Paul's 2009 publication, uh, before going any further with social capital, eight key criticisms to address. Paul Haynes teaches marketing at the School of Business um, and Management the, in the University of London. His core research interests include the impact of networks and networking on innovation and marketing practices. And he's previously worked at Cambridge University researching new energy technologies. Uh, so over to you, Paul, if you'd like to uh, start your presentation. Right, well, thank you very much. So I know that there are going to be a mixture of people, some practitioner oriented, some more academic oriented. And what I'm going to do is something which is like perhaps more of an academic style of presentation, uh, but in a way that tries to address some of the complexities of the issue. Uh, but I'll also make sure that it's engaging enough so there's enough, uh, enough scope for there to be questions where these can be all unpacked. So maybe the questions will be far more interesting than the, uh, than the actual presentation itself because of the nature of trying to uh, present ideas uh, with scope to uh, have a larger audience, as it were. So what I want to start by saying is, I, just a couple of quotes here that I think are quite important that I'll unpack a little bit later. So the first of these, uh, you might be familiar with them, but I, one of the criticisms is that to say that capital is social is not the saying that the social is capital. And I think there was something quite intriguing about uh, why there must be this, uh, this distinction. And I've got another quote here, which is talking about uh, the nature of social capital is something which is uh, to a certain degree, uh, a kind of colonization of, uh, of a number of disciplines. The assumption is that you have this notion of, uh, a notion of, of uh, capital, which is supposed to, it's called social capital, but in essence, is it just a way of trying to use a, an, an economic ideology and, and pinning that uh, into an area that's uh, again, associated with sociological geography discourses. So as a way of colonizing, and that's also something which I want to challenge, but I think it's a really intriguing thing that we do need to address. Now, the, the first thing I hear, which is quite important, I think, uh, is that we need to take the notion of social capital extremely seriously. Right? We need to take the critique of social entrepreneurship very importantly. Uh, and the issue is that if you find some of the more intriguing, more interesting critiques, uh, you can find that uh, it's not as straightforward. There's a whole range of criticisms, but there's also, uh, in my view, a really intriguing line of critique uh, that starts from the assumption that, uh, that there's just a huge number of issues about this ideology that I mentioned. So if we think about it as a, a kind of colonizing idea, the idea is, uh, I, how does this play out? How, how is this saying something about the nature of, I, of not just about, uh, about the social, how it, how it assumes that, that social capital works? What are its assumptions about I, the economic, the ideological and the structural nature of society? So Ben Fine is someone that I want to, uh, I want to begin with here. I can't actually see my, uh, my whole slide here, uh, but it, I, what Ben Fine says is that uh, that what we have to stop thinking about is that uh, social capital is something new. He has this idea that, uh, that it's one way of looking at civil, uh, civil society, but there are many other ways in which we should uh, address the, the issues. So what he says, and I, I think there's a, a, a neo-Marxist set of assumption here, he says that there's lots of other ideas such as power, class, conflict, hierarchy, and what happens often with social capital theories is they seem to put these things aside. They, they say, well, these things are, are, are issues that I might be an old way of looking at things, but social capital is one way of trying to solve these problems. 
Uh, and what he argues is that uh, it de-emphasizes what he thinks are the most important factors, such as the uh, power, conflict, class relations, hierarchy, and says, well, uh, maybe we should think about uh, the way in which cooperation might function, how individuals or organizations work together in a way that's more cooperative. And he argues that social capital ultimately offers a bland alternative to this neo-Marxist uh, set of assumptions, one which is highly conciliatory, but in principle, I, it's just another form of, of neoliberalism. And as you can see with, with most neo-Marxist approach, I, this underpinning I, a, a ways to rethink the relationship between I, different principal actors in society is that there's a, not, not necessarily a conspiracy, but there's a, a neoliberal set of ideologies that are underpinning this particular point of view. And he, he goes uh, much further than this. When he looks at the, the World Bank's paper on social capital, a largely uh, positive paper on social capital, he argues that, that there's not really been much of a debate. And where there is this, uh, this attempt to uh, at least respect some of the criticism, some of the critique, what happens is it's almost like it's drawn in to say, well, there's this, this type of critique against social capital. However, I, by acknowledging that this critique exists, what we're saying is that we're open to new ideas, we're open to engage with the concept. So he says that acknowledging that something's a problem isn't the same I, as engaging with it and producing a better form, a better series of ideas, better kind of social theory. So I would say that Ben Fine's work contributes to a broader critique. And this is that social capital represents ultimately uh, a kind of ideological discourse that reproduces a particular kind of political way of thinking. Uh, and again, I think Ben Fine, I, he takes seriously the concept of social capital. So he's not entirely dismissive, but I think it's very important that we try and engage with some of these ideas in detail. Now, as, uh, as Tristan said earlier on, I, what I, I, I was more interested in at the very beginning was to try and identify a series of criticisms to say, well, what are the criticisms? So I'm not a Marxist or a neo-Marxist, uh, but I think there's some quite intriguing ways in which if you want to take the concept seriously, you have to address like, some of the potential issues. And so what I, what I did, I was just draw out some of the, uh, the clearer, areas for critique, try and identify them and seeing I, how we could just put these in into a, a simple framework. So all I'm going to do, I'm not going to go into any details I hear about I, what these individual criticisms are. I'm just going to make sure that, I, that the argument doesn't need to be rehearsed a little bit later on, because I assume that some of the people here will also I, be quite critical of social capital and want, if they're intrigued by the possibility of addressing these through what I call the, the assemblage approach, uh, they'll perhaps I uh, have particular challenges, uh, they have particular uh, problems that they want to be solved. So I'm not going to rehearse these arguments over again. I'll just say uh, some of the, uh, the core ideas behind it. So the first thing is that I, for me, there are issues with I, the name I, social capital. I found a problem in that, not that it's necessarily a colonizing thing, but it doesn't really necessarily I, embody everything that, that something which is I, capital. And there are obvious reasons for this. So perhaps social capital isn't capital. The second thing is that I, not just for the colonizing elements, but many of the assumptions about the relationships between key actors, there might be the argument that social capital isn't really social either. So I, it, this isn't really a problem because if you look at something like actor network theory, I, the, the notion that actor network and theory are all problematic and yet it's still a convincing and powerful approach I, to understand the relationships between humans, technologies and a range of things. So the name doesn't necessarily uh, I have to be a problem, but it's just uh, to be aware that social capital has these issues. Uh, one of the other criticisms is that social capital might just be a renaming of, of a loose, I, I, I don't want to use the word, but a, a, a loose agglomeration of factors such as trust, like social networks, these kind of things. 
right, and how they they're found. I mean, in different disciplines, right, we find different structures, different features, right, which I have historically had different ways of being represented by trying to combine them together in a unified form, and and then having to find what is the common denominator might itself be a problem because we reduce its complexity. All right. Another issue which uh, I thought was a, a problem is that social capital sometimes is not really an explanation. It doesn't explain things. It tries to, in some ways, describe things out of existence. So another issue here is that I sometimes uh, the issues to do with social capital is that the change in communications are not related. So it's difficult to show a uh, causality between the two, whether social capital uh, causes uh, positive changes or whether positive changes are ways of building up social capital. Again, what I want to do later on is actually say that's part of this kind of interdependence. Uh, it shows the power, the usefulness of something akin to, uh, to social capital here. The other thing as well that I, I think is quite important is that social capital I, certainly is difficult to define, but it is impossible to measure. And one of the, the things which I had as, as a big problem is that I, some ways of, of conceptualizing I, social capital focused on the things which are measurable just because they're the things which are most measurable. So, for example, if you're looking at how social capital exists within an organization, let's say a university, right, the things that you can measure quite easily are collaboration between colleagues in terms of publications, right, how many emails are sent, but you're not, obviously not going to pick up right, the more important factors. You, and by focusing uh, on things which are, are measurable, right, you right, are really overemphasizing things which are, might not be very important. And I think with, a lot of researchers who I like, need to have these metrics like to be credible to have evidence like the problem is by measuring something that's slightly inappropriate changes the story of what you're trying to do with social capital all right another thing here is and I, again I, I think this is a really important thing because I it's it's pretty clear that social capital is a way of of creating for example networks and as we know, with any kind of networks, a network includes on the basis of excluding others. So this idea that social capital works and develops, but it can be a hindrance to uh, some sorts of developments by excluding. And again, a lot of the discussion uh, which we hear these days in terms of, uh, of trying to uh, make things more wide open, more inclusive, uh, more diverse, is about how we can include. Whereas if you have a system which I, has a degree of exclusion to it, you can see there would be this particular I, dark side of I, not just of things like nepotism or criminality or corruption. It might be a, a soft side of exclusion. And so we have to consider I, these sorts of factors uh, in a bit more detail, I think. Another factor that's quite important is simply uh, difficult to operationalize. And if you have some ways of operationalizing and they've been shown to be relatively successful, the idea is then can they be scaled up uh, in other forms? Uh, can they be trans, uh, translated into other uh, different social situations? And in my experience, I, there needs to be a lot of nuance in how this is done. And I think that if you have certain measures that have been shown to be effective uh, in one particular context, uh, and you don't have other patterns, the uh, the way in which you might think, well, this is an appropriate way in which I, I should try it, uh, because there's no other, other uh, attempt to do it, mean that operationalizing can be extremely problematic. It can be extremely misleading. So this is also the other issue, I mean, in terms of a more practitioner-oriented approach, we should think at least at the very basics of, I can social capital, does it do what it claims? Is it something which is likely to be effective for the specific context that a practitioner would like to work with? So uh, I've been working a little bit with uh, it's someone called Chris Hackley, and what we've tried to do at least is develop uh, some tests to see uh, the appropriateness of, of someone attempting to use a kind of social capital uh, paradigm. 
And again, we've just come up with, uh, again, from some combination of the things that we need to think about, like a series of tests, like the functional test, the intellectual test, ethical test, political test. And again, really simple ideas, almost a, a checkbox exercise. But the idea is we have to think seriously about, for example, like, does social capital deliver what it claims? Are social capital theories that are being used for this, this particular content that you're interested in, are, are they coherent, are they viable? Does the approach that you're taking to social capital perform in an equitable, sustainable way, okay, for good or for evil? And whose interests are served by this particular conceptualization or use of social capital? And this links back to some of the criticisms and some of the, the limitations that I mentioned before. So the idea is that if you're doing something uh, which excludes or doesn't open things up, is there a reason for this? Is there a strategic reason where this might be uh, something which is for the good of society? So these are things which need to be considered in a bit more detail. Again, I might, I, I might discuss this a bit later if people are, uh, are interested in this theme. Whoops. Right. So what I want to say here is that uh, there's also an important uh, consideration when we have a look at this critique. So we take a series of critiques. We say, well, I, of course, there are people from, again, neo-Marxists or people from, uh, from different academic and research perspectives that find the notion of social capital. I, it's not Marxist. So Marxists will find it's not Marxist. So it doesn't have these kind of, of categories to it. It doesn't have I, this kind of I, assumption about how power works or something. But what I would say, and I think this is an important point, is that there is an irony to this kind of critique that social capital represents a, a colonization. When Marxism itself is a proud colonizer of loads of, of fields by this uh, political economy thinking. And so if we're thinking that colonization is bad because uh, let's, let's take it that uh, I, moving to other countries and uh, expelling the people and subjugating the people is bad, that kind of metaphor. The idea is that Marxism is, is something where uh, it seems to be a, a, a very powerful approach uh, to try and push other ideas away. This idea of having uh, a link with other ideas, other themes, which is, is ultimately what I'm trying to develop here, is something which says uh, it's not about colonizing, it's about uh, linking with other existing themes, concepts, to try and develop something which is, uh, again, adaptable something which isn't imposing ideas but is is taking strengths and linking them together and i'll try and show that that isn't just fanciful thinking what i also want to say is that if we make the assumption that these haynes hackley tests are logically positive the social capital concept really does add value i for social science and for i understanding to try and think about the nature I, of our use of concepts and ideas why well, I think its value resides in rethinking notions of infrastructure, relationships, grouping, knowledge, technology, production, resources, coupling, all of the kind of factors uh, which are really important in, in creating any kind of a positive relationship between people, organisations, uh, objects and things. So in my view, I, to try and understand how these things fit together, I think is really valuable. And to, to be, and, and this is the, the case that I'm going to claim, is that I, we are thrown into situations where there's no meta narrative that is going to be able to like, help to explain things. I, things are emerging in a particular way, but things are decoupling, coupling. Again, to use, I apologize, for, but for using a, the Deleuzean concept of, of deterritorializing, things are uncoupling and recoupling all the time. We need to understand I, what's happening on, a, on an individual unit by unit account, but we need help and resources to do this. And I think understanding social capital, the way that I'm, I'm presenting it here, might be a way of, of doing this, or I hope it can at least, I allow people to step back and say, well, how can I map these things? What is to be included and what's to be excluded? But of course, this implies a huge number of challenges. And what I want to focus in on is how I, we understand the mechanisms that underpin this connectivity between things. So it's no good saying that there are huge networks and we really need to understand these networks in detail. 
Like we need to understand not just that there are networks, we need to understand how are they the, the factors that are incorporated, the components that are incorporated into these networks, how do they relate to each other? What's going on? What are the dynamics? What's informing these dynamics? How are resources changing? And how is uh, how are things emerging uh, through this combination of, uh, of components? So the conceptual challenge here is, again, a number of simple questions, is how does social capital operate? How does it support uh, these uh, civil society uh, changes that we think are, are so valuable? How do they develop this sense of common purpose? How do they allow engagement or they allow uh, I, people to be enrolled within uh, commonalities? But more importantly, and this is the, the tricky thing, which I'm not sure it's going to be clear to show, but I, it's important that they, they draw out certain features of reality, certain ways which can't be revealed elsewhere. So the question is, what feature of reality does this way of conceptualizing social capital I reveal? What would have been invisible if we look at it in a different way? If we have a generic approach to, to networks, uh, we haven't understand that there's a connectivity. What do we gain? What strengths do we get by thinking about it in the way that I'm going to present? And perhaps an analogy, it might be a false analogy, but this is the analogy that I like to think of conceptually. Uh, again, sorry, this is the academic side of me coming out. If we lo look at Granovetta's uh, notion of the strength of weak ties, Perhaps we can think intellectually, there's a strength of weakly organized conceptual arrangements. So the idea is that I, maybe a lot of these intellectual ideas do go together, I, but if we think too robustly and we, we sort of pack them into I, a very tight structure of how to see the world, again, creating this, this kind of meta-narrative I was talking about, we lose a great deal because I, we're imposing a particular structure on reality. I, perhaps what we need to do is think about how we bridge small scale interactions how we try and understand these, these interaction and relationships right, through a different kind of lens. So going back to the original quote, I didn't actually uh, I use the quote fully, but I, the question is why must social capital homogenize and degrade as, uh, as Ben Fine claims? I, I don't think it needs to. Uh, the, the point that I would say is why not help to retain the heterogeneous character of the entities comprising the network? There's no reason why things have to be reduced to uh, a single unit of analysis. Uh, it's not about creating a network uh, that's constructed of human individuals and nothing apart from human individuals. That makes no sense. So why must this notion of, of, of social capital be something which has a single, simple uh, unit of analysis? I don't believe that's the case. And I'm hoping that some of the examples I use towards the end of this will show very specifically that social capital must take these heterogeneous forms. So going beyond this uh, bonding, bridging, linking, uh, uh, again, descriptions which are pretty good, I think a more nuanced mapping of the meshwork, uh, again, to use, a, uh, I think in this case, uh, a Delandian term, I, is required. So understanding connectivity, not just in terms of these, I, these types of connections, but looking at a broader variety of connections. So the first point I want to make here is that I, I'm not, I, okay, the Delanda's assemblage theory, and I'm gonna use assemblage as opposed to assemblage. I, I just can't use the word assemblage. I, it sounds too French. Uh, so, Beyond Delanda's notion, I, I think there are other conceptions I, which are really interesting. I, Delanda's approach I, is, I, again, ironically, something that fits really, really well with a very generic understanding of social capital. So I would say to, to people who aren't fully engaged with social capital, they're not, they're not someone who's trying to apply it, try and think the, the nuances, the complexities of this. If you want a generic way to understand social capital. I think Delanda's assemblage theory is a really interesting introduction to this. What I'm doing is something that's very different. So I'm not trying to conceptualize assemblages or social capital in this generic kind of way. And I, I think that the kind of interactions and descriptions I, that 
I, the Delander moves on to, I, I think, take away some of the power of, uh, of both assemblage thinking and of the kind of social capital applications uh, that might be relevant here. So what I want to do is, uh, is to I, not rename social capital, but to rethink the kind of role that it can play. And what I'm trying to do here, unfortunately, is to try and tell quite a complicated story of, of how these elements work. Why? Well, because I think some of the simple ways in which I, people have tried to unpack social capital, I just really don't give us much to go with. We then start saying, OK, here's a way of thinking about it. Here's a prescriptive approach to, uh, to social capital. But really, I, where's the essence? Where's the power? What does it actually do? And I want to say, well, there are things that it can actually do. And I'll give some reasons, some strategies for this. So I hope... Uh, I hope we got plenty of time for questions. Uh, so I, all I'm going to do here is I'm going to try and, and mention a few uh, a few approaches, the kind of structure that I'm looking at. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, through some of the questions hopefully, unpack some of the, these ideas, link them to specific case studies. Okay. So the assemblage concept itself is associated with Deleuze and Guattari. And they've written a, a lot on this. I unfortunately, uh, they've written I, amongst them. I think twelve or fifteen different approaches, different I, not definitions, but different operationalizations, different ways of conceptualizing assemblages. That it becomes very difficult to find something that's unified from them. I think. In this sense, another irony is that the concept of assemblage is itself more of an assemblage rather than a concept. The notion itself appears in various languages, conceptualizations, which I like, predate the way in which Deleuze and Guattari describe it. It comes from like, a particular uh, a French uh, French word. So I like, obviously I like, assemblage is an English word to try and capture uh, a French concept. So the assemblage paradigm itself, what does it do? Well, it focuses on the persistence of organizational structure. So what happens is many of the questions about how things emerge, but the idea of how structure is retained, how it works through an organization is a really interesting idea. So how things are grouped together, how these groups stays together, and what are the challenges to keep things together and how they might break off into other things. They, these are the sort of uh, like things which are important issues that Deleuze and Guattari uh, raise. So the idea of persistence of organizational structure, but within an environment, that's characterized by a way that conceives the relationship between components comprising its structure. And these components, as I said, aren't units of analysis like, that can be reduced to the same things. There's not a, a reductionism to a particular type of thing. I, things are retained with their complexity. So an assemblage will include as a component, an organization, as well as a human being, as well as a, a community, as well as a technology. And so you have these things which are connected and the implications of these, the relationships within, uh, the, the relationship of components within the assemblage is something where it feeds into maintaining uh, the, the relationships and how from these what emerge uh, are a new series of components. So it's assemblages all the way down and assemblages all the way up. So there's no ultimate unit of analysis. So you say, well, what's the point of this? What's this supposed to do? Well, this can be contrasted with uh, a way of thinking of things organically, how things might be greater than some of, the, some of their parts and how things fit together to function. So assemblage thinking is in, in many ways the opposite of functionalism. The idea is that it's not all parts operating together to create something. I, I, uh, Deleuze and Guattari talk about how things I often, I, the functionality I, is more important when they break down. So the breakdown is something where we can identify things that work more effectively. Uh, but I'm not going to go into, into that. But unlike this notion of organic parts, assemblage components can switch between porous assemblages. And this also allows the identity of the individual item itself will be 
possibly an assemblage for other things, but to be retained in both of the assemblages or in all of the assemblages that it participates. So this idea that you don't have to belong to one thing like, for it to function, things can be pulled out related to other things, like, replaced with other things. This, in my view, I, it simply ref reflects many of the common sense ideas that we have about how things work within networks, how things work within our life, how things work within, for example, our house, how we take things out, replace them, I retrofit things into the house, I alter the ways we, we relate to things. And I want to make a, a more fundamental point, which is that, and that's how we see things within organizations. So what I want to say here is that assemblages are generated and modified by the multiplicity, not just the multiplicity that there are lots of different things, but a multiplicity of heterogeneous interests. And these only emerge as the assemblage unfolds. So the idea as things are working, I, as, as a group takes shape, as things are connected to it, then you get a sense of how things are all, all linked together, what they do, how they change, how they're modified. Again, I, I'm, I hope for some people this is not making much sense, and I hope for other people this is a sense, well, this is quite a banal explanation for how things work. So how would this be different from Delanda's idea of creating this sort of big network? Well, I'm going to say that conceptualize the type of mapping. Assemblages, I have this, these kind of features I, that make them interdependent relationships. So you have networks of socio-historical processes, I, which are then contingent. They're features like where they, they produce from, from aspects of desire, they produce like, structures, they alter their structures like, through this kind of network. They're not determined by the network. So what's the, uh, what's the implications of this? Well, this means that loads of processes shape the mechanisms of, of capitalism. We're quite familiar with these things. I, but what we need to do is to think about I, social capital itself. I, how does it address I, the particular relationships that it finds itself within. So you have, I, within a particular country, things are organized in a particular way. Internationally, things are organized in a particular way. The idea is how can something be put into this process? What's going on to maintain these things? And the things we, we call social capital I, will differ from economy to economy, I, from ecosystem to ecosystem, I, from country to country. So the idea of what social capital obviously will be slightly different in different places, but it serves I, this, a similar kind of role I, when you try and uncouple the different features I, within these assemblages. So in my view, we need to assess what these roles are, try and identify what the mechanisms, not what they are, but what they might become. And we will need to redefine the relationships as a capability in terms of what are they capable of forming. So if we think in terms of description, what is social capital? It becomes very difficult to understand, as I mentioned, this idea of, of cause and consequence, like what's causing what. But the idea of thinking about what you want social capital to do, how it's supposed to be active in changing things, I think is a, a really important question that we need to do. And in that regard, we need to focus on the specificity of the assemblage that, I, that, I, that you're trying to work with. So if you have a particular feature, you want to understand how you can improve social capital within an organization, you need to understand in great detail, I, what are the different players? What are the different features? What are the different aspects of that organization? not just what the limits are, but how does it connect with other organizations? What are the other ecologies that it works with? So once you start asking those questions, you get an idea of, of where the flows of social capital I, might be most relevant in altering things. And what kind, and I'll, I'll come with some practical examples of this in a short while, what form they might take, because it's no good saying, well, we need to have more social capital here. So well, what sort of strategy, what sort of thing like, do you need to develop? How could this work? And by thinking in this way, uh, even it's complexifying things, it provides clarity uh, for this uh, more sophisticated notion of, of social capital by focusing on the types of assemblages to harness, i.e. the social mechanisms that you try to develop that are subject to the type of capital like transformations that you desire. So we need to have a look at things like the type of structure the typology, the modes of transformation which are going on within, let's take uh, the example of an organization. 
when we understand the organization, understand how it's changing, what it represents in relation to what, what's the ecosystem that it's working within, then we get more, more of an understanding of, of the nuance of these, of these factors. And then we know where there's uh, the possibility of creating interventions and what are the likely consequence, what, what's the, the implications uh, of having in, having these interventions uh, beyond the specific type network that you're interested in influencing. So this is the uh, well, the last slide that I'm going to be talking about here, I, and this is the problem. So I I'm happy to go into great detail, and I'm going to I'm writing a paper about assemblages uh, which tries to unpack these. I, what I'm starting by saying is you need to think in terms of this level of complexity rather than think in terms of simply network relations. That's the problem. It needs a lot of investment, intellectual investment, uh, to get the level of of social theory. I, to make the case for social capital being a complex academic I, theme. But once you engage with Deleuze and Guattari, you have a further issue, is that I, once you start using Deleuze or Guattari in terms, such as, uh, as I mentioned, deterritorialization or body without organs, you, you find that it becomes very difficult to quarantine against the destabilizing logic that they have. But I'd say that's not a problem. You do not have to turn to a Delandian uh, type of network approach. What you need to then do is start thinking, okay, I, here's some tools, here's some ways of, of thinking about relationships between uh, networks, organizations, which don't necessarily involve uh, focusing on simple notions of trust or, or social networks. Let's see what their structures really are. And I, again, I'll try and give some clues to this. I think it addresses Fine's critique that social capital is an empty slogan. But I think more importantly, I, when I talk in these terms, it sounds really abstract and it, it, it sounds like perhaps like nonsense. But when you as a practitioner start looking at what you're actually doing to try and leverage social capital, like what you're doing is operationalizing it in a sensitive way like that has these assemblage like features. So the idea is that you're doing this and this is the kind of thing which I think academics should be I should be impressed with. It's something that you should impress upon academics who are saying, well, I, you're using social capital in this way. I, what's happening is that there's a projection or a, a sense of, uh, of finding things, I, because you're looking at, you're, you're defining into existence uh, a simplified way of understanding these concepts, which I, I don't think is there on the ground. And I think that when you look at the academic research on things like branding, materiality, leadership, I, and markets, and you have a look at the, the way in which they're put into practice, I, there are a huge number of productive ways of linking the assemblage paradigm to social capital. And my point here at the very end is, I, if we look at some simple examples of, of these things, uh, and then some complex examples, but from simple examples, uh, you start to say, well, yeah, we do really need to understand uh, this level of complexity or else we, we miss the point. So if, I, if I've got enough time here, I'm just going to address uh, one simple question with one simple answer. And the question uh, which, which can be asked is, why do some social campaigns raise awareness, money, leverage change? But they're in many ways, I not as not much different from other social campaigns, other social campaigns which are complete and utter failures. So what is it that these campaigns do like, that other people fail to do? And I think that this is like, the simple answer. Like, isn't the story about why it must be a bit more worthy or they're better at marketing themselves and stuff like that at a very broad level. I, I think that it's exactly this ability to understand and leverage things like social capital in this complex nuanced way, I, which means that they're very effective. And the reason uh, I think this is because uh, social capital as is conceptualized in this way is both assembling, but it's also something which is assembled. So for example, the, the example that I'm going to give here right, is I, when you have I, a brand, so when you brand something or you have a, a term or you have a particular metaphor, I, this is something which I ask to link many people simultaneously. I, people might, uh, in, in the same way that, uh, that you might have a, a plan, and a, a plan of a house, you're building a house extension and you have a plan. 
you might get architects who look at this plan and interpret it in one way, builders who interpret it another way, the, the, the council who interpret it in one way, you and the interior designers interpret it in another way. This idea that the plan itself of the house might be a sketch drawing, but it's something that each of the people like, who need to understand sufficient are able to talk uh, amongst themselves. This idea of talking across life worlds, this idea of it, it being a kind of boundary object. And I think in many ways, social capital is something where I, you can create something which resonates sufficiently for I, to engage and to draw other people I, into uh, a particular way of thinking or doing things. Right. So uh, again, this wasn't a normal presentation in there's one simple idea that's presented, uh, it's, it's unpacked, and then there's lots of examples, and then there's discussions about how I do things. Uh, so what I'm happy to do is address any questions, clarify any of the issues, uh, and again, I'm happy to deal with any critical comments and particularly any skepticism of this way of presenting things or other ways of addressing the relationship with social capital. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing and uh, I'm going to ask if uh, I, if Tristan would like to chair any questions, people have any questions, whatever strategy you have of, uh, of trying to interrogate these ideas. So I'll be quiet for a moment. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, excellent presentation and certainly really enjoyed it. So as Paul said, we'll, we'll have some questions now. Um, if you would like, you can put your questions in the chat if you aren't in a position to um, unmute yourself and, and ask them yourself. And I'd be happy to read them out. Um, or you can put up your hand and um, you can unmute yourself and, um, and ask your questions. I might take the, the first question, Paul, if you don't mind. Um, it's, it's kind of a bit of a comment, requires a little bit of explanation. I think, um, Social capital is often seen as being, you know, inter or transdisciplinary. So existing really between or integrating economics and sociology or social theory. And it seems that the predominant approaches that have been taken really have been to carry along the, the economic type of methodologies into the approaches to social capital. So uh, using, uh, you know, rational choice theory and things that are really methodologically individualistic um, in the approaches to social capital. And so it seems to, to create a meaningful synthesis of these disciplines and, and uh, to be able to operationalize social capital in a more meaningful way and address some of the criticisms that, that Ben Fine has about the lack of explanatory power that social capital tends to have, it would seem that we would need to somehow reconcile those those ontological foundations of, of economics and sociology. Um, you know, how is methodological individualism and, and rational choice theory um, reconcilable with the, the more sort of rich sociological approaches to understanding human experience? Um, so I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how, whether or not that needs to be reconciled and, it, and if so, how that perhaps could happen. Uh, again, that's a, a really good question. I mean, I mean I, for me, I've always had worries and doubts about uh, this idea of, uh, of trying to reconcile these, these different approaches, uh, because I see them as, as different ways of understanding the world, which I, I think are not, are not really consistent. I, the, the example that I want to give here is, if you define things in terms of individual units, I, and you think I, decisions are made, let's say a market makes decisions I, through an agglomeration of lots of individual decisions. I, the problem then is that you're automatically defining I, what the relationships are. You're saying that, that people are individual, they're separate, they're not coerced, they enter these, uh, these markets in a particular way. Uh, and the sociologist starts off from the assumption that we have to understand the social relationships between things. We have to understand the connectivity. Uh, we have to understand things at a broad level of, of community and stuff. So I think there's something irreconcilable about, uh, about assuming that, that things are one way or another. So the issue then is how do we join things together? And this is where I think this is why something like the assemblage approach is not, not a solution, but it's a way that addresses uh, assumptions. It holds these ideas together simultaneously. The idea is that we don't have to think uh, 
do we see the world in terms of like, just individuals or do we see it in terms of the social and cultural relationships? Do I make a decision by thinking about how much utility I'm getting or do I make a decision in the basis of what will other, how will this represent my persona like, to other individuals? I, I'm saying that, that in that regard, we can hold them as different approaches to, uh, like, to answer the same thing. We don't have to bridge them together because if we do, like, what happens is like, we lose aspects of the other, like, the other approach. So I, I don't think they can be unified. Uh, I think that we just have to accept that there is a, a wide variety in which we can, like, we can I reveal they, they reveal things about the relationships between uh, between people. I so there doesn't need to be a way of resolving them in in this regard. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, and I can see how the assemblages approach might provide that vehicle or that the the, the structure in which to do that um, to basically create to use a different word pluralism, you know, where there can be multiple different explanations and multiple different methodologies and ways of exploring and understanding the processes and the phenomena that are being observed without having to default to any one approach, whether it's the methodological individualism of economics or it's the socially constructed reality of social theory. You know, we can have multiple um, interpretations and explanations and adding to that, you potentially there's, there's ones coming out of psychology and, and cognitive neuroscience and even evolutionary biology seems to have some some meaningful things to say about the nature of human cooperation. So um, I can, without thinking about it a lot more, I think, you know, your assemblages uh, framework or, or approach could allow for that sort of pluralism potentially to, to occur. So it wasn't really a question in that, but if you want to comment any further before we move on to the next question. <laughs> it looks like we have a question from Marion, if you want to unmute yourself. Thanks, Paul. Now you know why I'm, I get up at 4 a.m. to come and talk to everybody. But anyway, um, my question, Paul, I suppose if it's not really a question, but um, how does, um, when you're actually looking at this, there's a group of us that are sort of um, have taken the somewhat questionable route of going down Bourdieu's um, uh, analysis. Um, when I say questionable, it's just that it's such a difficult concept and we're struggling with the concept of habitus um, and how to do this. But when I listen to what you're talking, how you're talking about social capital, this makes actually a lot of sense. Um, do you have any concept about how Bourdieu might fit in here? I mean, we're actually looking tonight in a conversation at uh, how you analyse across the um, the habitus capital and the fields, etc. My area that I'm interested in is open strategy, company directors and um, leadership. Um, completing my PhD, and a number of us are gathering tonight. Um, I know it's a painful question, but what's your view on how this all might fit into what you're talking about? Like Bordier well, and happy yeah. Well, well, I was thinking the, the notions notions of, of of capital itself, cultural capital, like mm -hmm. social capital, material capital. Uh, I I was wondering how playful I the uh, I the concept was being used. I mean, again, sociologists in particular, I do things with a I, in a way that's tongue in cheek or more of an experimental approach to to thinking in these terms. Uh, but in terms of habitus, uh, yeah, I I think in terms of I, the, I defining people in terms of I, behavioral patterns. Uh, again, when we're living in a a, a, a time in which I, these patterns are, are changing, I, I think uh, is again it's an intriguing piece of research. I'm, I'm not sure as in, empirically I, it's a. Uh, it's a great way of understanding what, how to divide people up uh, for, amongst them in terms of the kind of practices they have, their, their behavioral traits. Uh, so I'm, I'd, I'd be intrigued to hear in more detail about how you're, how, how you're applying Bourdieu, how you're critiquing Bourdieu. Yeah, um, a, a number of us, um, 
I'm in a business school. There's a couple of us in the business schools, et cetera, and in education um, are grappling um, with that. And I'm actually looking at it from a tortured habitus uh, concept and, and how that explains what's happening in that with the cap capital that people have, et cetera. Um, yeah, so, but I, I love the assemblage because it's actually, uh, it is loose, um, a loose concept, etc. But anyway, yeah, we're here struggling it, and now you understand why we get up at 4 a.m. and 6 a.m., which is Tristan, <laughs> <laughs> to have conversations like this, and then we're awake all day, so we actually get the opportunity to work further on it. Um, and when, we're meeting tonight uh, to actually sort of uh, grapple with it. But a number of us are in the business school, um, looking at open strategy, leadership, all those sorts of issues uh, from um, a habitus perspective. So uh, this actually is very helpful to think of it as assemblage. So we might, you know, some of us might do some more work in, you know, explaining examples and pericles of what you're talking um, about. I mean, the stuff on leadership, I, that tries to look at leadership in relation to uh, I, to assemblage approaches, which I could pass on to if you're interested. Ah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I, I teach MBA leadership. Yeah, so that'd be good. Okay, thank you. I'll leave it to everybody no, else you. now. Thank you. And I think also like we've, we've talked in, in some of these webinars in the past about um, you know, Bourdieu's uh, conceptual framework of habitus providing or clearly providing sort of the, 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 the foundational theory behind his approach to social capital and, and the other capitals as well, you know, as being basically human experience being uh, largely pre-reflective and based on presuppositions, um, you know, that sort of idea of uh, socialization and enculturation that creates, you know, our experience and and how that's really quite fundamentally different than the way, as I talked about earlier, most approaches to social capital take a quite an individualistic kind of rational choice theory approach. And just how different Bourdieu's theory is than virtually everything else that's done, I guess, within social capital theory. So should we have any other questions? Anybody else want to, um, you can put your hand up or unmute yourself if you'd like to ask. Yes, Alexa. So, um, yeah, uh, kind of a little more vague and esoteric question, but um, just, you know, context is everything. And so um, there's a difference between the um, context, context of um, the emergent culture. And um, so, development and um, ideas and how it could progress um, in, the, in the different contexts, um, or if there's any examples of uh, the development of social capital in uh, contexts that aren't the current descending paradigm. Does that make sense? I, I missed bits of the, the middle of what you were saying. So um, what I'm looking at is the evolution of, of culture and, and designing that. And so one of the things I see is that um, we have emergent culture ideas um, and certainly uh, some of the social capital falls into that. Um, but when they are applied in the context of the descending paradigm, they get co-opted, corrupted and cannot develop outside their infancy. And so um, I wanna you know, look at social capital um, and, and contrast it with, you know, um, how it can develop in the descending paradigm and how it's applied and how it could really um, be more fully maximized in, um, in culture design and in, in like um, the, the evolution of culture and um, more the emergent of what's coming. Um... Yeah, sorry, it's a... Well, that's a can, bit choppy. Well, can I if can ask a, up, okay. uh, sort of another point? Uh, so the, the issue, I, the place where I would think that uh, that'd be most interesting would be uh, a, again the area that might be described as 
uh, as the area of cultural appropriation. And the, the term cultural appropriation obviously uh, has come to mean uh, it's something quite negative, the idea of, of stealing or taking from one culture. I, often by a dominant culture for, for something of their own. But this idea, if you if you try and alter it and have the notion of, of cultural expropriation, where people from I, predominantly, uh, let's say, uh, disadvantaged cultures, disadvantaged parts of society, uh, use I, the, the ideas of the, the more advanced I, culture in ways which I, are transformative are ways which challenge the original culture's assumptions about how things develop. I think this is a way of, of being able to transform from a position of lesser power to a position of greater power. Uh, and I think this is something which might be afforded. This is a way in which I, I, social capital, I, to, to one degree, I, is, a, is a way of, of challenging I, the power of, of powerful cultures, powerful institutions, and benefit both cultures at the same time. So, for example, the model I might have here is that uh, you have the stuffy French, uh, I, French I, elites who are defining what the aesthetic, uh, the, the aesthetic principles should be. And you have artists who come along and say, well, I, if you do things in a particular way, I, you cannot capture what we're doing. We're producing something which falls beyond what you're attempting to do. And the only way you can try and understand and engage with our ways of doing things is by I, breaking down and altering your ways of trying to incorporate us because we're confusing to you. And in terms of great art, the idea of being confusing uh, is something which I, creates new standards. And by creating new standards, uh, what happens is you produce great art. And this notion of the, the way, uh, I, I guess, in which the outsider ultimately challenges and overturns these old fashioned principles. So this is a way in which uh, some forms of social capital can be leveraged uh, to create a, a, a kind of social transformation. And I think if this occurred I, I, in many, uh, as, as a general challenge, not as a, as a dialectic, but a way in which when cultures meet, there is this, this change, whether transformation necessarily involves this kind of I, loose appropriation and expropriation between them. So th that might be a, a one way of thinking about not the evolution of cultures, but certainly I, how, uh, I, how social capital might be then engaged to try and speed up this process within particular contexts. It doesn't address your question, but uh, at least it's another example of how I'm trying to uh, link the concepts of social capital to transformation through assemblages. Wonderful points. I, yeah, I definitely wanted to have it vague so to see where you took it. So uh, thank you so much. Any other questions? Right, thank you. Well, I have another question and um, while other people are thinking of, of another question. Actually, I'm not sure it's a question. It might be more of a comment, but I'd be interested in your perspective on this because I see social capital quite often as a, as a tool that can be put to various different purposes. And, and we've certainly seen in politics the, the tool of social capital being used by both the right and the left. And so it seems that it is, it is one of those ideas that can be shaped and molded to, to suit any kind of purpose. And, and therefore it already has that sort of inherent flexibility. And, and so I think when people approach social capital and they want to utilize the concept and they look for what exists in the literature, they find predominantly, they find one approach uh, for the most part. And that is effectively what came from, from Gary Becker and James Coleman through to Robert Putnam and is quite a you know, rational choice kind of grounded approach to, to social capital. If they do find Bourdieu, it's probably very difficult for them to understand what it is and even more difficult to operationalize it. And, and perhaps, you know, Bourdieu never really intended for social capital, his version of social capital to be operationalized in the kind of way that a lot of people do. And so I, I think, you know, there isn't currently an alternative, you know, there isn't currently something that um, is more progressive. And I think Ben Fine kind of alludes to this idea that there is a version of social capital or a conceptualization of social capital that could be transformative or progressive.
but that's that seems to be remain quite elusive as to what that actually is I, I have read thousands of articles on social capital and I still struggle to really nail that down and to understand what that is I'm just interested in your thoughts on all of that not really a question in any of it well, well again when you talk about the left and right I the idea of uh, just this idea of I, I'm sorry to use the word leverage so many times, that must be quite annoying, but I'm going to use it again. I, the idea of what is being levered. So the, the example, as soon as you start talking about the right, uh, I, I had the notion of how patriotism is something that then is a way of, of joining people together. So the idea of you use I, the myths I, that are associated with your, the family myths of your country, I, the myths of I, of specialness, I, the myths are uh, fed into this through the sporting prowess and something, and how this is then used as a way of, of excluding others or of, of trying to, uh, to claim uh, primacy over someone else or, or other groups. And the idea is that how the left use a different, different type of, uh, of metaphor, a different kind of approach, uh, which is the same kind of uh, of, of approach, but with a different set of myths. So the idea is that the left might have, have myths, uh, which are, again tell stories about I, the, the benefits of, uh, of immigration, I, the, the power of these individual changes, I, the way in which they I, I expanded suffrage. So the idea of, of having I, leftist myths that then are then drawn into and that's why we should be more inclusive and that's why we should I'd be more cosmopolitan as opposed to like the, the so the idea of I they seem very similar patterns which are used I in entirely different ways and uh, and so the idea is I uh, how evidence I is then used to justify what you thought of in the first place I uh, the the manager making the decision uh and then deciding to I, to ask someone to do the research to support their decision, I, I it stands to mind here. So the idea of how how social capital might involve I, the same kind of processes, I I, th I think is uh, is a fascinating issue. And I think you put your finger on uh, I absolutely I spot on by talking about I, the way in which you can be co opted for left and, and right, uh, and often using uh, not just those but a, a range of assumptions about how change occurs about how to enroll other people, how we need to build uh, this understanding, how we need to educate other people. Like things which I, in, in practice do not work. You don't get people to change their views by educating them. This does not work. And yet sort of trying to, try to focus on developing these myths, transmitting them in a way that educates people, I, I think is, again, it's a fascinating conundrum. Yeah, so it really means that, you know, the criticism that Ben Fine has, one of his core criticisms about the social capital being a tool for the colonization of the social sciences, it really means that the social capital itself, the idea, isn't necessarily that. It isn't necessarily, you know, economics imperialism, but that's the way that it's been used. Um, and same thing with, you know, the World Bank's approach to social capital, which was heavily criticised for, for reinforcing neoliberalism. Again, it's just the way that the World Bank used the tool. Um, the tool itself isn't flawed or isn't necessarily leading in that particular direction. It's just that's how it was used and that's the way that it was justified. And it was, you can see very clearly that it was justifying their agenda or that they already had before they started researching and utilising the concept. But I, I mean, I want to be explicit about this myself, just in terms of, uh, of my approach here, explicit about this. I, there is no reason why social capital I, has to be I, linked to a neoliberal framework. No reason whatsoever. It's something which I, fits that, but every single approach I, to how I sort of democracy, I, to I, to institutions, I, a whole range of things, I automatically I get uh, can be I, transformed into I, a neoliberal set of assumptions. So I don't think there's anything neoliberal about about democracy when you try and unpack it in its detail. I, 
there's an antagonism between democracy and liberalism. I, so I, I think that uh, this this idea that it's starting the assumption that if it's not Marxist or neo-Marxist, it must be neoliberal. I, I think is at, at the heart of of some of these critiques. I, ben Fine uh, again, uh, I explains it quite well. What I don't like a, a more dismissive approach is which. I don't try to engage with uh, the possibilities, the function, uh, the possible functions uh, of some of these ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, like in the past, when I've looked for you know this this more progressive or transformative approach to social capital that that may or may not really exist and is difficult to define. I've kind of looked for a sociological theory as the basis for that. Um, and that's kind of swinging the, the pendulum back away from, from methodological individualism towards something else that's equally, you know, quite um, singular in, it, in its understanding or its way of understanding the world. And, and so, like, I'm really going to be intrigued when you, you, you publish your, your upcoming paper to really get into that and see how the assemblages system really can perhaps help with that problem and perhaps create more pluralism in social capital. Uh, okay, thank you. Or as, as I want to mention as well, or because uh, there's uh, so many interesting examples about uh, about how social capital uh, is, is also being used. So you talked about left and right, uh, the idea of order and for social good, as opposed to uh, disorder and social bad. There's lots of really interesting uh, anecdotal evidence about how I, in I, where I was living for many years in in, uh, in Southern Italy, how organized crime uh, during the COVID crisis were contributing very positively uh, to needy people, uh, producing food parcels, helping people, uh, developing, I. Uh, systems of looking after people because they, they couldn't leave the house. And the idea of, of I, what's the reasoning behind this? What does it embed within, within society, embed within these different cities and regions? I think it's a fascinating question that we'll, when I, some empirical research in five or six years time, we'll see the, the impact of these, I, what look like social capital relationships, uh, how they've, uh, altered the relationship between organized crime and people's dependence within poorer parts of, uh, of Italy, and I'm sure in many other countries as well. Absolutely, and I think a lot of other things coming out of COVID as well will be um, fascinating areas for research in the future, particularly related to social capital. So I feel like I'm hogging all of the question time. Um, does anybody else want to pose a question or a comment, in fact, because a lot of my questions haven't been questions at all. have another question but i'll wait in a queue tristan uh, there's currently no queue marion so i think you're up <laughs> well this is a question out of left field and it comes less out of my academic life than my private life um and tristan i suppose yeah you might be aware i actually because i'm actually working on the concept of you know tortured habitus um in the business world etc and everything like that Coincidentally to that, I've actually been um, over the years dabbling in um, the organisation of Rotary. Um, I, I find it a good, a good tribe to actually sort of be part of. And part of those sort of models within society like Rotary, uh, possibly the Masonic, all that sort of stuff. Um, is anybody doing research on their ability to, as you sort of say, um, you know, develop that social capital um, because what they do, I mean, there's very, I'm, I'm thinking of Bill and Melinda Gates uh, and their efforts on polio, which are now everybody's very nervous about because of the divorce. Um, and Rotary have actually sort of worked on polio and they're now working on Alzheimer's, etc., in the research space. So it's a very large organisation um, does anybody do research on how they, over time, develop their social capital? So, because it's, it's an interesting assemblage, um, organisationally, uh, around the world. And I, I don't like to me mention the Masonics, but um, the Rotary organisation, you know, there's no politics and no discussion of politics and no discussion of um, 
uh, religion, et cetera, allowed within the organisation. Do you know anybody that's doing any research in this space? Because it's just, I find it quite fascinating just sitting and watching it, but. I was I was going to say it's it's not quite the same thing, but uh, I know in the, the broad area of social entrepreneurship, I mm. there's I I mean one of the one of the fundamental ideas which are, are being used in terms of the the triple bottom line uh, accounting is how do you try and account for uh, for social good? So we understand the financial side, we even understand the environmental. Right mm -hmm. side, but the idea of understanding social good, I has been quite tricky. I the kind of metrics that are being used are uh, again quite banal. I don't necessarily capture like uh, social good, and again part of the the, the basis of, of things like say, I bottom or base of the pyramid. I assumption is I uh, I wholly a capitalist self interested uh, approach, but I what you're doing is something which of of course I captures a large population but by doing good for a, a large population so i'm pretty sure there would be a, I, in the area of social entrepreneurship a huge amount that's been done uh, on trying to capture i uh, developing i uh, positive social relationships developing i uh, again not necessarily using the the term social capital to describe all of these features but using synonyms to i uh, to talk about the connectivity between i uh, individuals within I particular I distressed social situations. I'm sure there's a huge amount on uh, on this. Mm. Yeah, it's just a, the, the it's a point of irritation the, that I've got. I've got because um, Rotary provides people with the tortured habit. It's a very streamlined access to utilize and gain and develop social capital. So, and that's one of the organisations that I watch. Um, I, I'm pers I personally have watched is that Rotary organisation, etc. Anyway, I, I'm just I'm not seeing any research on how that's developing. But anyway, post Excuse me, Marianne. Postdoc. No. I am doing <laughs> some research, building, trying to building the social capital here in Mexico, Guadalajara, Mexico. I am from economic approach, and I am introducing some collaboration factors, 21 collaboration factors that we can use to build interorganizational uh, frame or in their organization. Maybe I can send you a couple of papers that I made. Um, maybe it could be useful. I don't know. Yeah, if you could send them through to Tristan, um, that'd be great. Yeah, because, uh, you know, for the broader group. So just to be interested in, so yeah. Yes, because I built with about six dimensions to create the, the collaboration inside the network or inside the organization. And I made with all these um, case of COVID-19, yeah. about a three cases of study building the social capital. Good. Tristan, I think maybe in the broader group would be very interested in that, don't you think? Yeah? Yeah, I think so. We could okay. share that. Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. Okay. I, I will think send it... to Tristan yeah. the information. I think this discussion also feeds in and relates to a general interest that organizations are increasingly having in demonstrating social value or demonstrating the impacts, the social impact um, that they're having. And so there, there are some quite um, you know, finance focused tools that can, that are being used to do this, such as the, the social investment or social return on investment. Um, types of schemes that really try to place a monetary value on the social impacts of a particular activity or a particular organization. And so I sort of see interest in social capital in that space often being uh, similar, you know, a, a desire to want to try to, um, you know, highlight the value, communicate the value, if you like, or the importance of, of the social aspects of, of an organization or a particular project. 
and that's quite often uh, again like talking about the the dominant culture or the the dominant ideology it's often because those things are undervalued or, or overlooked basically in in the dominant paradigm and therefore um, people feel like they need to find a way to communicate them um, and they get some sometimes they go all the way to trying to place a dollar value on them which is it seems to be quite problematic in, in, in its approach but then social capital isn't doesn't involve a dollar value so perhaps it's a it's an alternative way of communicating value. But also on, th on top of this, uh, in parallel, I, or maybe even a reversal, I, the many uh, investors themselves, I use investment I, as a way of trying to, I, to nudge organizations to behave in a way that, that fits with their, their particularly positive, progressive agenda. So the idea of, of I share ownership and campaigning I, during the AGM or I, the, the recent, I talk about cultural appropriation, but the, the recent examples of people I, saying we will remove I, our investment or our sponsorship from, uh, from your organization unless you can demonstrate that you're, I, you have progressive ideas or you're developing things I, in a serious way or you're taking sustainability serious, which then means they have to create uh, I, ways in which they're accounted for sustainability. I think I, a, a, a nice parallel issues, and this is, a, I don't want to sort of I bang on about this, but this is exactly the kind of, of structure which an assembly days must happen. The idea of these things are interdependent and one triggers something and the other triggers uh, the other that leads to this sort of ecology uh, of change or transformation. Absolutely. And I think as you were presenting, um, talking about assemblages, I realized that um, that approach is effectively what I do when I work with an organization, um, you know, because I really do get in there and look at their context and understand what they value and the way they do things and the sorts of processes that are happening, you know, within that particular context. And so I think, you know, I've probably been doing it for years intuitively, and I think you're the framework of assemblages and that way of thinking about it probably creates, you know, a bit more purposefulness about the way I could perhaps change the way I, I work with organisations. Interesting. So I guess in that respect, it's kind of, um, you know, validating your work already because I've probably already been doing it in practice, of, but just not really having the, the terminology to describe what it is that I'm doing. So any other questions? No, but just a comment, Tristan, about- Well, I'm gonna um, steal your ideas I'm, as a case study then, if uh, in that case. <laughs> Feel free, that's what this group is all about, supporting each other. <laughs> thank you, it's been fabulous. So yeah, I think, um, yeah, thank you very much, Paul. I think, yeah, I think we might be running out of steam unless anyone has any, any final questions. No, shall we, shall we wrap up then? Everyone, thank Paul very much for, for your time and, and your insights into all of this. Um, this is a part of an ongoing series of webinars. The next one we have is in, in two weeks time. So you can check on the website or the Facebook group to, to see the details. Uh, and if you would like to present your research in some point in the future or your ideas on social capital, um, please get in touch and we can, we can talk about scheduling something as well. Uh, so that's it for this session. So um, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks very much, Paul.